Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, once more, just because of the signage issues, I want to make sure that you're in the correct session, the What's Next for Drupal Auto Update session. If you were looking for the Tailwind session, that is next door. They're both 3.2, but there's A and B. Um, but otherwise, it looks like we are good to go. So we're going to jump in here shortly. Uh, this is a panel discussion type session. Um, we are going to present a little bit about uh, the initiative, um, riff on some things you may have heard in the keynotes and, and in some other places. Uh, but we're also really hoping to get your questions um, and to uh, be able to answer any concerns, feedback, uh, clarifications that we can have from you. So hopefully that means we didn't make too many slides and we have lots of time for, uh, for going through that. Um, brief introductions, you've probably seen me all over the place a few times already. But I'm Tim Lennon. I'm Hestinet on Drupal.org. I'm the CTO of the Drupal Association. Um, so uh, together with a small and mighty engineering team, we maintain the tools on Drupal.org. And in this particular instance, because automatic updates relies on the update information served by Drupal.org, you know, we're key partners in the initiative along with the core contributors that work on the Drupal side and some other components that are Drupal agnostic. They're part of kind of the wider PHP space. Uh, so we'll talk through some of those, but that's myself. Um, Neil, why don't you go ahead? Uh, so yeah, I'm Neil Drum. I work for the Drupal Association on the engineering team and have been working on some of the server-side components of automatic updates. Uh, I'm Wim. I work at Acrea's Drupal Acceleration team, and I'm, I was involved for a solid six months or so working on the Drupal module side of things, but I'm really just channeling Ted and Adam Honig, who weren't able to be here today. Um, so, uh, representing the module side of things. They're not dead, they just couldn't come to France. I just want yeah, to yeah. clarify that sound. <laughs> <laughs> you sounded very sad. Um, hi, my name is Jess. I'm XJM on Drupal.org. I'm one of the release managers for Drupal Core and also one of the handful of people who originally was involved in the very first proposal of this initiative, which is going on seven years ago now that we've been, we've been trying to get it off the ground. Um, so we're, we're close to the finish line now, which is very exciting. I haven't been involved in the development in the past couple of years because I was busy with this thing called Drupal 10 and then this thing called Drupal 9 before that. Also laid off twice in the past year. Um, but uh, it's obviously a very important initiative for us because we're concerned about the stability, security of core, and the stability of the upgrade path, which auto updates is a big solution for. So that's why I'm here. Cool. So um, again, we'll set, we'll do some, uh, spend some time setting the stage and setting the context for this conversation before we take your questions. Um, but do you know jot them down as we go? Um, you know, the place we want to start, I think, is talk about the overview of why we need the up auto update system in the first place. And I guess it sounds obvious, we would love sites to be updated automatically, um, but what's kind of involved in uh, creating what we need? So um, one of the biggest issues is security. Um, as the Drupal.org infrastructure team, we get some statistics, people reporting back what version of Drupal they're using, right? Which means we know how many sites are still reporting back a version before a major security release, right? And we know how many are out there that didn't patch something important. And we want to really make sure that we can increase the security posture of Drupal sites to be secure by default. But at the same time, uh, code updating itself is kind of a terrifying thought. So we want to have an automatic update system that ensures it doesn't become a vector for distributing you know, man-in-the-middle attacks and malware that turns all these Drupal sites somehow into Bitcoin miners, right? That's not, not the place we want to be either. And so, in order to do this, we need to evaluate best practices from other systems. We don't want to come up with an automatic update security model from nothing because there's a lot of software that already does this. Um, and if we can, we want to think about systems that could work for the wider PHP ecosystem and not just Drupal. So Drupal can perhaps prototype uh, this auto update concept, but we talked early on with folks at Typo3, at Joomla, at WordPress, um, and they, and they all had interest in some form of this for their own projects, and we said, well, let's make components that are hopefully generic or could be extended uh, to secure more PHP. And then lastly, this is foundational work that goes along with the project browser and other things, right? If we're talking about securely installing an update, that's not too dissimilar from 
securely installing a new module. Um, so we want to, all of these things have to abstract away from manually managing Composer on the command line in order to do these things. And so we can leverage it not only for this sort of security use case, but hopefully for making it easier for folks to install modules. A lot of foundational work. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how we made some of these decisions. So I'll go through one more slide here and then uh, we'll talk about the other components. I'll hand it to some of my uh, uh, co-speakers. But uh, first is what was kind of the basic sort of cryptographic or specification or um, structure that we were going to use as the basic building block. And we looked at a variety of things. We looked at the OpenBSD projects, Project Signify or Signify, however you want to pronounce it. A uh, variety of different things before settling on a cloud native computing foundation project called the Update Framework, Tough. And the Update Framework is there is a Go implementation, there's a Rust implementation, there's a Python implementation, and it's used in some pretty like enterprise level production contexts. Uh, it is also used in uh, uh, sort of securing the supply chain of delivery for over the air updates for some autonomous driving vehicles and cars and things these days. So it has some attention and some support um, and it's got some mathematically interesting features that are over my head, but that <laughs> some folks that I trust um, uh, have faith in. Um, so Tough though is really, as a project, it's not software itself. It is a specification. It has reference implementations and it has a few community implementations. But one of our first things is that we would have to build a PHP implementation of this um, tough signing process. Um, and so what is this component as part of the larger auto update system, right? This is something that says, hey, I've requested an update of my Drupal site. Here's a core version. Um, uh, I think that I should be getting this package from Drupal.org. Is that the package I actually got, right? This is the, the basic thing that we're trying to do. Um, so this breaks into two components, right? The source, the server that is actually serving these updates, and the client. Um, so uh, Neil, at a very high level, would you just talk a little bit about the sort of server-side components, and then either Wim or Jess, depending on how much voice you have. Okay, Wim, what we're trying to do with the client. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Drupal.org, of course, dis distributes the uh, all of the... Uh, uh, all of the updates for uh, Drupal, uh, Contrib, and Core. So we need to provide the actual signing so the client can, uh, can check that. Yeah, it's relatively straightforward. But as you may or may not know, right, if you're using Composer, you're actually, your third-party dependencies are probably pinging packages and getting things from GitHub and elsewhere. But all the Drupal components come from a Drupal.org owned and managed packages endpoint. Uh, packages.drupal.org, and so this is why we're already the central management point of this and where we're at the right position to insert the signing into our infrastructure. But um, Wim, can you comment on sort of the client side stuff and what we want to do with Drupal? Just the basic overview before we get to the details. Um, right, okay, so I wasn't sure what slide we were on exactly, sorry. Um, yeah, so the automatic updates module, um, it first uh, does a composer install into a separate staging directory to make sure that completely without, without touching your production life site at all, we're fetching the necessary files and we're validating that everything is in good order. And we're also doing things like making sure that there aren't, um, uh, for example, database updates present that might be risky to install. In order to do all of those things, we're using Composer Stager to create a safe completely sandboxed install of uh, all the dependencies. And in order to make sure that the dependencies we get are actually the ones we think they are or claim to be, we're using PHP Tough to make sure that they weren't uh, messed with while uh, in transport. And so um, it is thanks to PHP Tough that we are able to be very confident about the things that the Composer has fetched for us, that they are actually the things that they claim to be. Um, so we'll speak in a little more detail about how we, what, what, it, what is involved in running uh, the server implementation of Tuff. So Neil, you've been collaborating with uh, one of our partners on this. I'll let you speak to it. Yeah, so uh, Tuff, it's a specification. It's not a implementation. Uh, so we uh, wanted an implementation to automate signing. Uh, so we worked with Consensus Enterprises to uh, 
build that and make it uh, able to be automated so uh, our packaging, uh, at the end of packaging, it can sign, uh, sign everything. Uh, so he called that uh, rugged uh, to go with tough. And yeah, the stats report is, uh, that's uh, rugged is functional where uh, as we're going through the next steps, we're finding and fixing bugs. Uh, so it's, uh, we're making sure it works at scale. Uh, we built a proof of concept uh, deployment uh, to get the client side uh, head start on having some actual data instead of uh, sp speculating on what uh, tough signed releases would look like from Drupal.org. Uh, but we built that pretty quickly and it's junk now. Uh, it was pretty helpful in finding uh, some bugs and getting, getting them started, but we didn't build it in a way that was worthwhile to save. Uh, so when we, turn, we turned around and built a staging deployment uh, that is uh, pretty much production quality and so that's done. And all of that was for uh, mostly contrib. Uh, Drupal core is actually hosted on uh, packagist.org and uh, the downloads uh, come from GitHub. Uh, so we don't control that part, um, but we'll have to build a mirror of that for Drupal core to uh, sign that as well. To clarify a little bit why that is, right? Um, the assumptions sort of built into Composer are the, source, the sources when you say Composer install a package name, what it's checking first is the listings in packages. So we're publishing core and the subtree splits to GitHub so that it's there by default in packages. And then as soon as you download Drupal, it adds the extra um, package endpoint source of Drupal's own packages, and that's where the rest of Contrib comes in, so. Yep, and that's, uh, that's as far as we are with the server side. Yeah. Yep, and then so on the client side of things, um, I was involved with making, with identifying these things uh, and uh, like getting them going, but it's uh, mostly uh, Ted and Adam uh, that have made these things happen. So uh, back in Pittsburgh, um, we had a Drush console command, uh, rather a Drush command, I should say. Uh, but of course, we are not adding any Drush commands to Drupal core, so it had to be converted to a Symfony console command. That has happened now. And the really cool thing about this, um, or the really crucial thing, I should say, is that it allows a different user, meaning uh, a different user than the web server, to be executing the actual uh, logic. So you can do it in a completely isolated, safe way if you choose to do that. If um, you're not on a shared hosting environment um, and you really want to control in complete detail how this actually works, that's now possible. Um, and you would then need to do uh, some additional setup, like setting up a cron job to actually make it happen. So Symfony console command instead of trash command. The second thing is that now it's compatible with the automated cron module that Drupal core ships with by default. And it's on by default, if I remember correctly. Um, but the challenge with the uh, automated cron module is that it, it kind of runs at the end of uh, a random incoming request every once in a while. But PHP has this thing called max execution time limit, so it can run for only 30 seconds by default, some environments maybe five minutes. But that may not be enough to freshly fetch all those packages and so on. And so what we did, or rather what Ted and Adam were working on, is uh, spinning up a separate PHP process at the end of an incoming request, which then is able to run for however long is necessary. And so that means that even on uh, very restricted hosting environments, uh, you're not going to run into execution time limits. Uh, and that uses that Symfony console command. And then last, um, we, for core updates, were, um, at least initially, restricting um, the automatic installing of updates uh, to only those updates that do not also change the database schema. Because executing database um, updates or applying update functions, there is a higher degree of risk than just deploying code. And we want to absolutely avoid any risks there. Um, so we had a very rough, worked fine, but there were false positives uh, approach. So we had an approach that was very rough but had false positive potential. And that has now been made much stricter, much more precise, and it's actually using uh, the built-in lexing stuff of PHP to accurately determine precisely if there is an update or not. So that means that effectively more updates will be able to automatically get installed because there will be fewer false positives. Yeah, I'd like to highlight something that Wim said, sort of 
buried the lead a little bit in talking about to make sure this works in shared hosting environments, to make sure this works in servers with less resources, right? Half of the value really of auto automatic updates is not for highly resourced teams that already have deployment processes and update schema and they're a whole CI, CD pipeline and all this stuff. It's to be there to make Drupal uh, have a lower total cost of ownership and be easier to maintain and secure at mid and smaller scales as well. So those use cases are super important when making these technical decisions, right? We can't just say, oh, we're not gonna bother doing that because that's only a problem on shared hosts because those are some of the people we're trying to protect. Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, should I cover the tough client libraries? Um, yeah, maybe t t talk about this briefly, sure. Uh, regarding the database update limitation that is a, like that's MVP limitation that we don't do database updates, we may later allow sites to opt in to running updates automatically that do database updates. It's just that, especially for the initial version, we're trying to make it as low risk as possible. Um, and, and also regarding um, the shared hosting versus having your own CI, it's also it's also extensible so you can use our tools with your CI. You can add a yeah. step to your CI that does like the tough validation and so forth, uses our composer stager or not, depending on your needs. Yeah, and uh, we make sure that uh, unless it's absolutely necessary, uh, security updates don't have database updates. So uh, uh, not having automated database updates will still uh, allow automated security updates. Yep, so that is uh, the really crucial thing. Pretty much no security update in the past recent history, in our memories at least, has not had a database yeah. update. The worst, thing that, the worst thing that we did was flag node access for rebuild. <laughs> okay, and that is not in destructive. My, in, my, in the past eight, year, eight years. Yeah. So and it was just my term on the security team. Right, okay. So hasn't happened in a very long time, yeah. but of course it means that we need to, as a community, uh, while working on Drupal core, but in the future, long fu long distance future, when I'm working on Drupal Contrib, we all need to be better by thinking about the consequences of update hooks, and we need to th make sure that they're really thoroughly tested, because imagine that an update rolls out, everybody installs it automatically, and all Drupal sites go down because we got something wrong. Like, that is, that's the reason why we're being very, very careful. So, in order to make sure that we can safely uh, fetch those um, uh, updated dependencies and making sure that they haven't been tempered with along the way, we have these tough client libraries. Um, so, PHP tough does the actual verification, the composer integration is a separate library, and these things are built in a way that are not at all Drupal specific, they're not integrated uh, into the module itself, they're completely separate packages that can be used by other projects as well, and they can be vetted independently of the Drupal module code. And so, Nothing in them is related to Drupal in any way, and it also means that we can review them independently, security audits independently, and so on. Um, and maybe you want to take tough testing? Um, I'm actually, I might skip through because I do want to give a sense of time for questions, and it is taking time. Uh, there's a, I'll say briefly, there's a lot of things that we are doing in terms of um, validating everything that's going to be needed for the um, like experimental release of, of automatic updates. So varieties of testing metadata, um, issues, is the file size too large, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the examples you see here. Um, and we're continuing to work out some of those details. Um, there's some status for when this stuff is going to be in review and what's needed that we'll speak to briefly. Um, Wim, why don't you take, well, which, either one. Sure. <laughs> Uh, so the package manager merge request against Drupal core is ready. It's passing every core test. Uh, it's being generated automatically from the contract module, um, fully automated, and it's a need review view. So if anybody's uh, uh, interested in digging into that, uh, you're very welcome to. Uh, the automatic updates merge request is pretty much testing, uh, passing all tests, but there is a regression deep in the crevices of Drupal 11 patch system that is causing some tests to fail, but it's passing on Drupal 10. We'll need to figure that out, but it is ready for review. These few tests uh, will be figured out. Yeah, and I think we might have skipped over that uh, automatic updates, it's for Drupal core, it's two big components, package manager and automatic updates. Uh, package manager also uh, will uh, automate composer for uh, project browser. Yes. So that's the independent component that will underlie both auto updates and project browser, and then automatic updates builds on top of that. 
both of which building on top of the generic PHP libraries that were created to do the things like tough validation. Um, some steps that are not described here as like regular Drupal issue collaboration review. Uh, the association is paying for security, security audit um, of all the non-Drupal components right now. That audit has already begun, so that includes the rugged signing server, the server side. It includes the client libraries, and we're having actually the same uh, sort of firm and um, a group of folks who have audited the Go implementation and the Python implementation so that um, we'll learn from the things they did and that we have the benefit of the people who actually have experience with practical implementations of the security side of things. So that's ongoing. Um, we're gonna start moving into Q&A um, and I think uh, I will kick off with the one that I think is probably top of mind, which is when are we gonna get this? <laughs> when is this actually coming out? Um, and so we've talked about this before. Um, this is a, a 2080 rule situation. So there's maybe a 20% chance that we could still get this into the 10.2 release. Code freeze is end of October. Um, and there's a like hit list of urgent things that we need to do that we're really putting a lot of resources into. Uh, however, we're doing a security audit, for example. We'll be doing framework manager and release manager review, for example. We do those to find things, and those issues may take time to fix, and we might miss that line. So the 80% bet is, in the, is on the June release, the 10.3 release, uh, as being the most likely candidate for when this is in core. Um, so just because I'm sure that's probably the, the top most important uh, thought in, in folks' minds. Um, anything to add there before I open it for other sorts of questions? Okay. So uh, there's a microphone in the center, which I hope is uh, hooked up, we'll see. And if you have questions, feel free to come over there or raise a hand and uh, I'll repeat a question. Yeah, and we have one from the app already. Uh, yes. So the question is written, is this part of co a core module or part of an update module? I think we'll clarify, yeah. So this is a new module in core, but there are changes that are being made to the update module, pieces that are being taken out that will be redundant, um, and it's and like the entire parts of the interface will no longer be required. Um, the whole thing where you like paste in a URL of a contrib project to download it to your code base will obviously no longer be necessary, for example. So there will be changes to the update module, but the update module as itself, just as an interpreter of Drupal.org's uh, release information is, will still be there. Um, but there's, so that's, there's actually two core modules. That's the package manager that we talked about that handles the actual composer interactions. And then there's the auto updates module which takes care of validating that an update is, is safe for your site, that it meets all the requirements that have been configured, and you know the cadence and when to install the ty types of releases you would install and for all that logic is, is and, and the updates themselves are done by auto updates. Um, I noticed that people are drinking water empathetically, and so I'm gonna try to stop talking here. But then in addition to those two modules in core, and the update module, which will be stripped down from what it currently is, there's um, three packages on GitHub as well yep. that that we are using, but that Typo3 and Joomla will also each be using at least one of. Cool. Any more on the app yet? Yes. Yeah, that'll work. Hi. Um, just want to say thank you for all of the work on this. It is, it is really great to see, and uh, it gives me a lot of confidence as a developer in kind of, you know, the implementation, and I wouldn't at all be scared to enable this on my dad's website, for instance. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, uh, to ask a little bit about kind of, because uh, I know you just touched on the, the user interface side, and with um, Project Browser being a, another big thing that's coming kind of in is interlinked with this, um, how how much kind of collaboration or thought is there on the, the sort of how those user interfaces are going to uh, connect with each other? Because um, presumably you want, you know, um, auto updates to work independently from a UI perspective of Project Browser um, and also just to say that obviously the, the usability group is here to help if you need any help with those things, so. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say a few things and when, uh, one, one of the basic things, 
uh, that I'll say that maybe we should, should cover earlier. There are some previous recorded sessions that have some examples of like sort of demo UI kind of examples uh, from previous cons and things like that you can look at. But also the other thing to say is, right, we're focusing on core to start. Project Browser's focus will be on contrib to start. And so there's a little bit of a, a sequencing that's going on there uh, deliberately in terms of thinking about, you know, core point releases, security releases first. Then thinking about, okay, what's the way you could do this for um, uh, miners? What's the way you could do this in contrib? Those will be future phases of the initiative to add more and more value over time. Uh, but I think. Um, yeah, so the sequencing means that they're separate, but the intent is also that we didn't know at the beginning when which thing would be ready. We didn't want to like make it a hard blocking thing. Yeah, we didn't want to make sure that they're tied together. So package manager was blocking the two, so both project browser was blocked on it and automatic updates was blocked on it. So package manager is truly critical. It has almost no user interface, except for I think a status report entry. So you're not gonna really notice its presence. Project browser is gonna have a very rich uh, user interface. That's uh, what you saw in the keynote session earlier as well. Um, but it's focused on finding contrib modules. And so for that reason, it has a, a very different need and a very different user experience than the automatic updates module. And the automatic, automatic updates module, you kind of don't want to notice. You kind of want to make sure that your site is up to date, I think. And uh, at the moment, it's limited to just Drupal core because for Contrib, we don't know if every maintainer is strictly adhering to semantic versioning no, if they're... I, we know that every right. maintainer is not <laughs> adhering to strict semantic versioning or paying attention to what kinds of breaking things they put in their updates. Yeah. Slightly optimistic, somewhat <laughs> pessimistic. <laughs> but totally true. So nobody wants to risk this, not even optimists. Um, so uh, I think that if, over time, automatic updates will get a richer user experience in the sense that there will be more settings added to allow it to be more granular about what country things you may want to um, have installed under what circumstances. But now I'm really extrapolating. None of us have talked about this. This is far future stuff. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it is also of note that um, usability review is not a beta blocking step. Um, we, did, we kind of glossed over the fact that the 10.3 the date that we're targeting for June to have auto updates in core is for it to be in beta experimental stability. So beta experimental stability means a module gets security coverage, it gets bug fixes, it gets um, a, a BC guarantee, uh, an upgrade path, all of that, um, but it has not yet finalized its user interface. Uh, usability review design, such as it, there is, I mean, it's right now it's very, very basic, old school for me, um, that that would be happening more as we progress from beta to stable, so after 10.3, we would begin to work on the user interface more and we would have the opportunity at that point because I'm sure pa I'm sure that project browser is going to be stable by then for sure. As soon as package manager's in, like the project browser will be in the next release, I think. Um, we, we can, you know, take at that point, see where we are and make, make improvements and, and lo those logical connections where necessary. Yeah. There's a little bit of UI for the readiness checks as well, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, which is also kind of old school. <laughs> yeah, so right now, the, the kinds of UI that you would see if you install this, or if you install the contrib module version, which is like sort of a testable thing, not something I would do in production probably, but <laughs> you, could, you could certainly play with it. Like your options are choose to run an automatic update on like a button press, an attended update basically. Choose to say, yeah, I'm gonna opt into doing it on cron and check the readiness report which says, uh, do we have right permission to be able to stage the files and a few other little things, right? Like, is yeah. there enough space? Just making sure your site's in good condition to be uh, updated. Like, you know, if you've hacked files locally, you shouldn't auto-update because the site's not in a good place. Yeah. So, but what, uh, you know, an underlying thing that we said here, especially in the contrib module discussion, is I think once this is present in core and there's greater and greater demand to say, can I auto update to the next minor? Can I auto update my major top 100 contrib modules? Is probably we will need a community education campaign again about 
semantic versioning, about good hygiene in your release process, and all these sorts of things. Uh, but I think by showing the value of doing an updates in core, we can kind of provide energy to that effort. So we'll, we'll do that when we're showing what it delivers. That community education campaign also hopefully will eventually become tied to metrics that are used in what's promoted in Project Browser. Yes. So module maintainers who are good about semantic versioning, who don't break sites with their updates, um, who opt into security coverage, all of those things that make a module safer to update to would also be surfaced higher in the, in the default sort of project browser. Yep. More questions? We have a couple. Oh, we do. Here. In the app. Yeah, bottom first. Uh, okay, so one is, is the Symphony console command a replacement for doing composer updates? Um, no, is a short version. Um, the Symphony console command is, is about being able to run this whole process, which is going to take minutes at the very least to uh, fetch the new, basically create a copy of your entire site and then run composer update there. So composer update, yeah, it's kind of, it's using it under the hood, but it does a lot more than just that. Yeah. And I uh, should say all of this does use composer internally, uh, or emphasize that, so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the idea here being we're not suddenly breaking away from the architecture of composer-based management for these sites. The, all, all these things, like the heartbreak and the, the heartburn that went into doing that in the transition to Drupal 8 is actually being preserved, but it is trying to abstract away from the complexity of that when it comes to keeping your site up to date or when you're installing modules with Project Browser. Yeah. Um, next question is, can auto-updates fix, like, or handle composer patches or will having patch files in Composer be a manual concern? That's a really good question, and my memory is a little bit rusty on this, but um, I'm 98% certain I still remember. Um, Composer plugins, because Composer patches is a specific Composer plugin, but certain Composer plugins, we don't know what they're about to do, so we need to be really confident that we understand the consequences of using a particular Composer plugin. Because Composer plugins, in principle, can do anything they want somewhere on your file system, which means it's highly risky for us to execute arbitrary Composer plugins um, during this process. However, we all know that many projects, many Drupal sites are using patches, so we are taking extra care, and we're going very far in making sure that Composer patches, the plugin, is correctly installed. Uh, we're making sure that uh, when you're, for example, updating from Drupal, 10.1.1 to 10.1.2, just saying uh, a example, that the patches that you had applied are still applying and that the entire process is effectively working correctly. And that's one of the things that automatic updates is indeed going to be checking for you. So uh, if the question was more about, is it, I think the question was specifically about the patches that I once applied, are they going to continue to be present? The answer is yes, there is extra validation to make sure that we do not break that case. But it's possible that a certain core update, for example, would mean that the core patch no longer applies. And that's a thing that would be that detected automatically then, that we and don't break your site. You would fail the validation check. Yeah the, re yeah, the readiness check would tell you, oh, we can't automatically update because you have a patch that's no longer valid. So then the manual step would be to uh, do it manually because you would need to point to a newer version of the patch that would be able to apply. Or hopefully that patch has been committed and you can just get rid of it. That would be magical. <laughs> Um, other questions? I'm just all good. Ah, okay. How will this work on platforms with read-only file systems or like major common platform hosting providers, whether it's the Aquas, the Pantheons, and things like that? Um, it won't. Um, those hosting platforms would need to uh, provide alternative integration. Um, so by default, automatic updates would. Um, need to be able to write to a separate place in a file system. That's one of the readiness checks that Niels, Neil has mentioned. Uh, if it can't, then it cannot operate safely because it cannot do a sandbox in which it's verifying that everything uh, is in good order. Um, so it is possible for any hosting platform to uh, provide an alternative to that. For example, I would imagine that you would, like Jess already mentioned, um, uh, generate a merge request or a pull request against your GitHub repo, or your GitLab repo, whatever the system is you use. And that would then be the time saver, but it would not be automatically deployed. It couldn't because the hosting platform in this case would be preventing that from happening. 
Um, we did talk about this a lot when I worked for Acquia because obviously Acquia is not going to allow you to write, have your application writing to the web server. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of different options. You can like r have it run in a staging environment and then just deploy from that. Or you can use the APIs that it provides. It does have like a full API to integrate it with your existing CI CD stuff. Um, and I think uh, uh, Lee Rowlands from Previous Next did kind of a trial run of this for us with, because Previous Next is, uh, also is not gonna let, you know, you, the web server write to the file system um, and, and gave us some feedback and improvements to make based on his initial testing. Uh, we expect we'll get more of said testing once we get to beta. I can imagine a world in what this looks like is a, these platforms either providing to their customers or allowing their customers to configure yeah, a, a, a CI pipeline step that runs and says we've detected an update, we've attempted the core automatic update process, the output was an artifact that looks like it works, and you know a one-click deploy or even say if this pipeline succeeds, a deployment from there. But that'll be partly up to those platform providers to choose how they want to implement it. Um, so. Uh, that said, most of them, all of them that I'm aware of, have been aware of this initiative and of the technology underneath it. So they're hopefully working on their roadmaps for that kind of integration. And really quickly, if uh, I can pause quick, how many folks host on like a large dedicated Drupal specific hosting platform? If you would raise your hand real quick in the room, okay. And how many are here partly because you're interested because you're rolling your own infrastructure and wondering kind of how this can help your sort of team? And for everyone who didn't raise your hand, do you want to shout like what kind of case that is for you? I'm just curious. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, uh, you know, if you have a CI, D CD pipeline or testing uh, integration testing of the site, I, I, in the ideal world, we would all have, uh, t you know, tests for if the whole website works together. Like, yeah get that automating updates uh, and use the parts of this that are good for you for that. But yeah, any additional uh, testing for if you have it in your pipeline, uh, use it. Okay, checking the app here again. We have, I think, five minutes-ish to go uh, for additional questions. No more in the app. Uh, we've got one here, please. Hi, um, it's not even on, I'll just share it. Um, uh, a little closer to the mic, if you would. I don't think it's... Oh, it is on, actually. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's James from the History Channel here. Um, oh. So one of the things that we still get comments on using Drupal is around Drupal 7 and what a horrible upgrade process that was. This seems amazing, you know, what, what's coming down the line. And to go back to the Drupal Village <laughs> comment at the start of the, the DrupalCon, and mentioning around, you know, 60 second website builders, one and one, you know, Wix, Squarespace. Yeah. You mentioned around re education of, uh, of, of, and reintroduction for the Drupal community. But what about external? Once it gets to a point where it's in Drupal core, is this something, you know, all the talk of marketing that will be used to help market Drupal to show that it's more user friendly to smaller businesses? I think it would be stupid for me to say no. Absolutely. <laughs> well, but I, um, it's my opinion that that automatic updates is critical to Drupal having future growth at all, right? Like it's 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 more than just a feature. It is an essential initiative and missing functionality right now. So yeah, but I think there's more nuance to your question than that, which is to what extent will it be part of a core sort of charm campaign? Um, to say, you know, have you looked at Drupal lately um, to understand what it can do? And I think it should be essential to that. I think, um, you know, we are up here mostly as not the Promote Drupal initiative or some of the marketing folks, but in touch with them. And I think you're right that one of the things that, actually we do this a lot in Drupal, is we ship something extremely powerful and extremely cool. And then the next day we've moved on because <laughs> we have something else to do and we haven't talked about it yet. And I think that is, in fact, going to be crucial. But, uh, but yeah, this, this is something that, you know, before we go all out on marketing, like it needs to sink in, get out of the beta phase, uh, and, um, you know, get all the use cases where, you know, we're going to start with 
cores automated if there's no database updates, like in all the other use cases. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't want to tell people, market it and say, hey, everything's automatic updating and have that be lies. But because we'll get there. What we're building has, we're building something that doesn't exist elsewhere in the PHP ecosystem. Like the Word, WordPress's auto updater that does not do the things that we're doing. Um, it's, it's new to Composer everywhere. So it, it is actually a really huge thing from an engineering perspective. It is very exciting, but yeah. we're kind of, we have to make sure that it works. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, we've- I, I, I wanted to chime in on one thing Jess said, like it is a huge thing. Like I joined at the beginning of the year and I worked on it for six months and I know a fraction of it. <laughs> it's, it's such a big thing with the, the libraries that are separate, that are not Drupal specific, that are integrating with Composer, the PHP tough validation. There is so much going on. I've never even seen the code. Like there's so many layers of abstraction that we need to build on for this thing to be understandable at different layers. Uh, yeah, it's, it's mind boggling to me that these people have been working on it for so many years. I've only been there for a blip. Um, it, I think I'm gonna ask my own question perhaps, unless anyone has one that's really burning, which is in our last uh, two, three minutes, uh, if people want to get involved, if they want to somehow contribute to this, uh, what are ways that they can do that? What could they do tomorrow? Um, what are things that we'd like them to take a look at? Um, I think it would be great if you uh, installed the automatic updates module locally, gave it a try. Uh, specifically installed an older version and observed whether it worked well for you. Uh, thoughts on uh, the user experience, um, on documentation, anything and everything. Yeah. And if there happens to be anyone in the room who's extremely knowledgeable about the batch system, please find Wem and talk to them about that issue. <laughs> The question, so the, let me repeat. Yeah, the, oh, <laughs> well, I'll save your voice for th one sentence. The question was, would this ever happen for major version updates? Could it be a 11 to 12 or whatever? It's feasible if you, all of your contrib modules are using non-deprecated APIs. It's not an architectural limitation. It is a um, policy decision not to allow that. But theoretically, it's possible and you could turn it on. We just need, we need to go a ways with the ecosystem for that to be feasible. Get, um, you know, more contrib compatible by the day the major is released and so forth. But with Rector, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, maybe this is hopefully a one sentence answer, but, um, if I wanted to still do updates manually, could I use the wonderful new like console command and stuff to uh, do the readiness checks and run the updates and things without it, you know, still doing them manually? So, <laughs> I see Jess nodding yes, but I'm not sure that that's actually true. And maybe I'm out of the loop on that. It's just attended updates, right? Which there's a button for. Okay, yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, it's like manually triggering the system yeah, yeah, yeah. console command instead of clicking the button in the UI. You're right. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely supported. Um, so yeah, you can test that way for sure. And you can think about, again, do you want to integrate something along those lines into your own already established deployment workflows? You could begin to explore that, even though we're still doing some work, so. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for coming. We really appreciate your time. Thank you again. Thank you to the speakers and contributors. Please come find us during contribution. Come say hello. We appreciate it very much. Have a good rest of your day.